Good evening, and thanks for tuning in to another episode with Affinity Community Services. Um, I'm your host, Aisha Trust Miller, for this evening, and I just want to wish um, our audience and the viewers and our constituents a happy new year. This is our first show in 2013, and tonight we've decided to talk and strategize um, on an issue, in my opinion, that is one of the most pressing issues in Chicagoland, in, in the world, per se. And it is community safety and violence. Besides me is the awesome Fresco Steez, a.k.a. Angie Rollins. Hello. <laughs> a fierce community organizer and educator, amazing poet, writer and artist, and a youth advocate. Hi, Fresco. Thank you for sharing your time and energy with us no tonight. Problem. No problem. <laughs> um, so before I begin, I just want to spread a little words about Affinity. Affinity is a social justice organi organization that um, works with and on behalf of LGBTQ youth, families, communities, and um, community at large on intersecting issues. Um, so again, I'm here with the amazing Fresco, and we're just going to chat a little bit about community of violence and safety. Don't forget to call into the show. The number is at the bottom of the screen. If you have any questions, comments, or strategies, or tools to uh, address this issue. So, Fresco, um, before we start, just tell us a little bit about yourself, your journey from uh, a youth activist, and I use that term lightly, to a now influential community organizer and educator. Um, so I started community organizing when I was 13 years old. Um, I started on the South Side of Chicago in the Woodlawn area with an organization called South Side Together, Organized for Power. And I was their housing organizer for a while, and then I switched over and did youth organizing. Um, I began youth organizing on juvenile justice work and working to shut down the Audi home and get restorative justice centers to rehabilitate our youth. To, so we don't snatch them out of the community, that we keep them in the community, and the, we as a community rehabilitate and re, and give our young people another chance. And so I worked on that until I was about 18. Um, I've started my own organization that does relief work with Haiti, um, and now I work with Affinity. Um, I work with Organization of the Northeast on the North Side. That's my day job, and. <laughs> I'm just community organizing around the city, so. All righty, all righty. So, um, to begin, as a young person navigating Chicago and all sides of Chicago, um, how do you perceive community safety and violence? How do I perceive community safety and violence? Either or, not, not together, together. Um, I perceive community safety. Um, in a more of a radical revolutionary way of the community taking responsibility for the safety of the community and not leaving the safety of the community in other people's hands not handing off the safety of our community to authority not ha handing it off to police officers that also sometimes lead us get led astray and have dealings with the abuse and and the violence going on with our community we need to get back to neighborhood watch and policing our communities ourselves and the methods we used to have the practical methods of elders sitting on the porch and getting engaging young people instead of being afraid of young people and pushing them out all right um and if you are willing to share with us um, in your experiences with uh, violence in Chicago, whether it be int intrapersonal, which is from person to person, mm -hmm. or on an institutional level? Um, violence, violence is an expression of anger. Um, and so for violence to be prevalent in a community, you have to ask your you have to ask yourself why is your community angry mm -hmm. violence is also for me an expression of poverty when there's extreme poverty in our community when resources are taken out of our community that's what you'll see you put resources back into our community and you engage people in a positive way you eliminate violence that's it's very simple to me um, violence is happening with our young people because they don't have the resources they need. They don't have the jobs, they don't have the food and shelter, they don't have the things that they deserve, and they don't have the adequate education that they deserve and that, that is responsible to them. How do you expect someone to grow 
and be a person that you want them to be if you haven't given them the resources to do so. Okay, well, I believe we have a caller, <laughs> and this is a live call-in show. Hi, right. when you were talking about community involvement, sometimes I wonder how far it should go. I can remember when I was growing up, and they had a lady in my community that was prostituting herself. The people in the community got together and said, hey, you know what, we're not going to have this. Uh, they had, when they, if you had a person that was selling drugs, Guess what? The people ran them out of the community. Say, hey, I got these big mortgages. I want a certain. I want a certain quality in, in in my neighborhood. And at one time, they even had the games like the Disciples and Blackstone Rangers, and where they had these treaties, where they have an understanding. There was certain with me. You, you call it whatever you want to call it. Leaders, whatever. There was a certain understanding what we will uh, tolerate, what we we don't. If, if you even go down to Chinatown. I have said this before, Chinatown have gangs down there, but guess what? They have an understanding of what they will and will not tolerate. And when you have certain types of problems in the community a lot of times, guess what? Those very gang members, I ain't saying it was right, those very gang members, guess what? People went to the community, uh, in the community went to them to resolve certain types of problems. Even uh, the police would communicate with them, and they had an understanding once again what certain things they would not tolerate in the community has some type of form of communication. Definitely. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I, yeah, I use the term uh, healthy boundaries or boundaries. We had we had boundaries, you know. Like I said, we had what we would and would not tolerate um, in our community, and had a way of collectively addressing it. Um, in regards to uh, one of the blocks I just moved off of, um, off of 69th and Vernon. Um, we had, you know, guys on the block that got into domestic altercations with their partners. And instead of always calling the police, which really escalated the situation and sometimes put the young women in more danger after they left than the danger they was in before we called the cops, we talked to the guys. We weren't afraid of the guys, you know, particularly me and, and talking to them about um, effective communication, uh, control and tempers, forms of meditation, um, forms of relaxing within their capacity, you know, just talking about the wrongs and acknowledging and holding them accountable. Um, I, I, I see us in a place to where we we don't want to tolerate it no more and we just call the police to handle our community issues. Um, and I believe we have another caller. Oh. Yes, so one thing that I think was key that you started that conversation off with, one of the points that you made of community involvement, was that when there was a drug dealer in the community, the community ran them out. And that is, in my opinion, not to be extreme, but one of the downfalls of the black community. Instead of being inclusive, we lost that. We lost, we lost that inclusivity. We lost that take somebody in and show them a different route. Instead, we, 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 assimilated to the society that we are in and grew cold and we decided we just push them out what's mine is mine and I want to keep mine the way it is and when I, I want mine to be better so I need to push you out you're lowering the market value of my property so <laughs> I'm gonna push you profit over people <laughs> so I'm gonna push you out of the community because I want my market value my home is not worth a person's life and it's not worth a the it's not worth the value of turning a person into their optimum omnipotent human being and you have the power to do that um just another statement just conversation uh, i remember being a young person growing up in later projects and my grandmother her house was like the house that everyone who was ostracized from their family came to um drug addicts prostitutes um uh poor white people who families ostracized them for being in black communities or being involved in drugs and it would just be all these in my opinion strangers in granny house but my grandmother helped feed them clothe them 
uh, if it was they didn't sleep outside if it was cold like they were community even though they were on the fringes or margins of community they were still community and it wasn't until I got older and got that language that I knew what they meant but as a child seeing someone who was trans who was um, kicked out of their family or uh, queer folks, um, other LGBTQ folks, that wasn't new to me. Like it wasn't like I had to learn how to interact with those people as I got older. Those those were people who were part of my community. They made up my grandmother's household. So it was very a very non-judgmental space and it really created a tight unity amongst my family to where um, when I guess we did things that was infractions or uh, mount infractions upon society, our family didn't push you away. We brought you in tighter because you needed more love and more support. So we didn't push out prostitutes. We took you in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we understand it being as a means of survival, but made sure that if you're going to do this, do it as safe as possible. Um, do you um, know the people you're going out with? Does someone else know who you're going out with? Are you using condoms? Have you got tested? You can go to these places. And no one had the experience of training, but they have the experience of of life and they shared their stories and I think um, that's the most influ influential is sharing stories and mentoring and doing things of that nature mm -hmm. um, and Fresco I just want to ask you a question what um, personal encounters in the city of Chicago uh, regarding violence have you um, survived um, if you're willing to share that <laughs> <laughs> personal encounters of violence well I grew up on 63rd Street so I, I grew up on the corner of 63rd and Normal, so... Um, Inglewood. Inglewood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I know a lot about um, violence. Um, I went to a school. I went to Hyde Park Academy. Um, and for high school. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so, I saw a lot of violence there. I saw more violence going to high school than I did in my years growing up on 63rd and normal um that's because i had the privilege of having a mother that kept me in programs and kept me out of my neighborhood and kept me engaged and consumed with positive things to do but going to high school and coming home from high school i saw um anybody that knows how park knows we've had shootings in, in the lobby of the school we the 63rd street bus i would be riding it and there would young people would get on the bus people not just young people because that's the problem right people just blame it on young people but people in intergenerational intergenerationally would get on the bus and shoot and all the students would drop to the floor so we don't get shot because there are bullets ricocheting through the bus and so like seeing things like that seeing people pulled off a bus to be beat getting to Inglewood High School and people running on the bus trying to grab girls talking about I'm gonna rape you like that is a problem the question is how do we fix that problem mm -hmm. do we call the police and when you call the police and get young people or get people arrested, what does that do? Does that teach them not to do things or does that just make them angrier and send them back out into our community? Yeah, that's that's definitely like uh, something that um, my family and community in general, I believe, is, is struggling with is um, you hear these phrases like restorative justice and transformative justice but I'm a little conflicted on how do you restore something that was never there in the first place like <laughs> um, this past summer my uh, my my younger cousin was murdered in front of um, his home mm -hmm. um, he wasn't gang affiliated um, uh, and by no means was he um, uh, didn't get into mal infractions, but he's a young person. We all have done things as a young person and adults. Mm -hmm. But um, the way in which his um, death took place, you know, he was gunned down in front of the home with an AR-15, you know, and it was just like instantly, like how these drugs uh, and these guns on the street, how would my community do this to me and my family when my, me and my family give so much to community? I kind of took mm -hmm. it personal. And, um, hearing so many stories before that of watching the news and seeing countless young people and countless young men and women incarcerated um, and murdered is just, 
And you, you know, and, and to feeling like I would I would hope that this happening to my little cousin would be the last death in Chicago of a young person or a person mm-hmm. in general. And it wasn't. There's been over 500 um, homicides in Chicago last year, you know, mm-hmm. in comparison to losing 300 U.S. soldiers in, in, in the Middle East. Like, mm-hmm. um, so it's by no no far-fetched idea why that why folks call chicago chirac you know um it's just how do we deal with this while healing and dealing with the hurt because it's it's impacting us our communities our families our schools and then we send the young people to school who are traumatized and expect them to perform to uh these certain standards to pass Mm -hmm. tests like they're only intellectual beings and nothing else um so that's just something to sit on the brain, and we have another caller. Hi, caller. Um, yes. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. Um, what I wanted to know, I'm um, like, what are the necessary steps that we can do as a people, as a community, to help raise the awareness of this situation to stop young young kids in general from being subjected to this type of treatment, to this type of violence. To, have to, to, to stop having to go and result to violence, how can we get the guns off the streets? How can we get the parents more involved in their lives? What can we do differently? What can we do different? Thanks for calling in. Um, so, you know, my, uh, my, res- my solution is always comes back to basic problem solving skills. It comes back to putting jobs and putting resources in our community so that people don't have to resort to violence. Um, Getting guns off the street is a very complicated thing. When we have a system that puts guns on the street, that makes guns readily available to people, that people, and you can get a gun from anywhere. Uh, Guns are easily accessible. How do you stop the influx of guns coming into the country and coming into our communities? How do you stop that? A gun ban, a gun ban is really, for me and my experience and work, pointless because most of the guns that you see on the streets are illegal in the first place, so the they're, the ban doesn't help. They didn't get a registered gun. They didn't get a registered AR-15. They got their own personal illegitimate one. And so we need to stop it. We need to stop trying to take change the weapon and actually change the person. Give the person basic problem solving. Get back to those basic problem solving skills of talking. Of coming into communities and coming into houses and holding circles and holding mediation sessions of when people have problems in the community instead of going and get your cousins and shoot them up and stop changing and we have to change this violent culture mm-hmm. transform transform it well i remember being a kid i was afraid to do something wrong because i was afraid somebody would see it tell my mama and then it was going down <laughs> so that's how like parents that's how parents was involved it wasn't just like a parent only was concerned with their child or their kin or someone in their family they was concerned with all the kids all on the block all the kids in the school all the kids in their city it Mm -hmm. wasn't an issue once the issue was brought to your door your household it was an issue because it was an issue of the people Mm -hmm. um and we do have um two other questions that we want to try to get to um the first one is what about people who want to bring the national guard to come um, into the community. What, what's the ideas on that first? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I hold on, man. <laughs> My opinion. <laughs> I don't really understand. What? Yeah. So, yeah. why would you? Your solution to gun violence is to bring people with guns <laughs> <laughs> into the community. That would have kind of been like bringing. Uh, uh, nooses to the civil rights movement. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to noose all these people that don't believe in civil rights. <laughs> like, but on a, on a serious note, like how do you have, uh, I just don't understand, how do you bring 
the authority that is taking resources out of your community back into your community to control the people after they've taken the resources out of your community. So how do you, so one of the problems we have besides gun violence is the lack of resources. The fact that our children, young black and brown children, can only go to college or get their secondary education through militarization, through things that they don't necessarily want to do. And so it's either I go to the army or either I sell these drugs or either I join this gang. So you want to bring the army in to police the young people who couldn't go to the army and are in choice selling these drugs or joining these gangs. I don't, it's a conundrum and it seems like a cycle. Yeah, for me, it's the same way. It will increase racial profiling, will increase oppression, and it's not promoting peace. Um, I, I guess I could understand the concerns of people, but as a South Sider navigating these systems, navigating um, gun violence, nav navigating street violence, I don't. And I, I still don't rely on the cops, and I wouldn't want to rely on the National Guard because the same people that you're calling in to protect you, they're going to be harassing you, your family, your exactly. sons, your next-door neighbors, and you're going to be like, this is not what I wanted, and instead of um, being creative, coming up with solutions, doing the hard work. And that's what it is. It, it's hard work because it's dealing with people. It. And instead of us wanting to do it ourselves because we're the ones greatly impacted, we want to pass it off to people who are... Um, not adequately trained to deal with community issues as this such and only see the violence and not the root causes of the violence because that's not their job to see the root causes of the violence. So how can they have the answers or strategies or solutions to community issues when they're not part of that community? Um, then we have another question that says, um, where do your rights begin at another person's end? What is that? Uh, I'm not fully aware of what this means, but I can make an assumption. And if I'm incorrect, um, you can definitely contact us at Affinity Community Services um, at www.affinity95.org. You can email us, hit us up on our Facebook to continue this question if my assumption is incorrect or if you have more questions. But another person's, your rights does not end when another person rights begin and vice versa. Um, human rights are human rights. <laughs> and if within exercising my right, I'm infringing upon your safe space, it's your voice and um, uh, you holding me accountable to express that. It isn't, it isn't necessarily uh, about rights because once again, rights are something that are chosen by your government. I want to think beyond your civil rights to your human rights, moral rights, rights that's not in doctrine and paper. Um, knowing um, the right and wrong and not something that's black and white but with shades of gray. You know, mm -hmm. knowing uh, what, our, what our parents and community taught us when, uh, when we were children, treat others how you want to be treated. That's where your rights as a person begin and end when someone else's rights begin and end. Mm -hmm. It's treating this person as if it were you. I remember you took me um, to a community organizing set at Getty Funa Flavor and a Honduran resistance leader um, made a statement in Spanish and he said, I exist because you are. You know, I'm living, I'm blessed with this life, um, not for me, but for the people. And I owe a collective, I have a collective responsibility. Yeah. I'm not living my life just for me. Yeah. Um, and if you believe this, then when you're greatly impacted by violence as such, you're going to take it as this is only my problem. When when I dealt with that and my family dealt with that, we had an entire community to support us and still supporting us now to get through that healing process, which, in my opinion, is going to take a lifetime. And so if you don't have community to rely on and lean on, you have no community to also hold accountable when things go wrong. Definitely. Um, so let's see. We have another question. Um People are, I believe, desperate mm -hmm. when they experience family members being killed. That's why they want to call the National Guard. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, this is a, it's a, part, a second part to the National Guard question. And again, you, 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 you're definitely right. Um, you're definitely right, but we will have to continue um, this conversation via email on Affinity. Uh, 
we may um we definitely would continue it in 2012 2013 excuse me because again this is a challenging year um i don't believe community has addressed the issue of violence in chicago like it needs to be um if so the numbers wouldn't keep increasing um definitely. money has been cut from caps um, power has been given to commanders and we as a people need to do something extra so have a good night and um thanks for tuning in to affinity community services and our public access television show. Thank you and have a blessed night.